Hey guys, welcome to Reignited. Now, if you haven't seen any of my videos before, my name is Sky and I've been a Dodge technician for the last 13 years. Now, my channel has a specific focus on the Hemi platform and a large part of that has been dealing with the Hemi tick issues that have arisen. Now, in this episode, we are specifically focusing on the lifter failure that occurs in these engines and what are the best practices and methods of prevention that you can do to help save your engine. We've got a ton of information here, so let's get straight into it. Now, if you're not sure that lifter failure is exactly the tick that you are facing right now, I have another video, go ahead and check it out right here, or I'll link it down below, that basically breaks down all the different kinds of ticking noises that these engines can potentially make, and that'll help you narrow down if this is exactly what you're looking at. But again, in this video, we are focusing on the lifter failure. Now, what exactly is happening here with the cam and lifter failure on the Hemi engines? Well, your lifters, as in most all modern engines, is a hydraulic roller lifter. That means this back portion here is hydraulic and it takes up any of the lash. That's why you don't have to lash valves on modern engines because they have this hydraulic portion here at the rear of the lifter. Now on the front side of the lifter, you have this roller that has these little needle bearings inside of it. Now what's happening here is these needle bearings are failing and allowing this roller to, instead of roll smoothly, to either seize up completely or allow it to jump up and down. And this basically hammers away at the surface of the cam lobe itself and starts to eat away at the hardened surface there and actually cuts through the lobe until eventually you no longer have a lobe. It's basically just a round circle and you have a constant misfire on that cylinder. That's essentially in a nutshell what is happening with the cam and lifter failures in a Hemi engine. Now I do also have a bit of a suspicion here that the problem is not solely related to the lifter itself, but it could be with, related to the camshaft and due to the hardening surface on that cam because I have seen a lot of these failures where the cam surface, the hardening on the lobe has started to flake off before the lifter itself has started to fail. So it's kind of an interesting correlation there, but it's a chicken or egg scenario. The end result is the same, that you have to replace the lifters and the cam. And this can be a very expensive repair for you guys out there who are not mechanics, I would say at a minimum, you're looking about $4,500. A lot of times places just recommend replacing the engine altogether because they don't wanna deal with the liability of repairing an engine that has some metal bits floating around in it. Now, I will say from my professional experience that most oftentimes you can get away with just a cam and lift a replacement on there. The engine itself will likely be just fine. Here's the specifics on that. Now, this is directly from Chrysler. Now, keep in mind here, whenever I'm saying Chrysler or Dodge, I'm referring to Jeep, Dodge, Ram, Chrysler, FCA, Stellantis. It's really all just one big company. On the 2009 and later engines, there's what's called an oil control valve that is located underneath the intake manifold. Chrysler's recommendation is, if you are facing a lifter failure, remove that oil control valve solenoid, and there's a metal screen on that solenoid, and look to see if there is bits of metal on that screen. If there is bits of metal on the screen, there's enough metal in the system where Chrysler says, to be safe, go ahead and replace that engine. But if the screen is clear, you can just get away with replacing the cam and lifters. So that's my advice for you guys as well. On my own personal vehicles, I won't replace an engine just for a cam and lifter issue, but it's because I have the capability to easily fix it if something else goes wrong. For you guys, I would say go ahead and follow those guidelines that Chrysler laid out. So if you have a problem here that could potentially mean that you would have to actually replace your engine, clearly that's a big concern. But now that you have an understanding of what exactly is happening inside the engine, let's talk about why it's happening. Also, I just wanna throw in here real quick that I will be covering a lot of information that has been covered in my previous videos. So if you've already seen some of this information, I'm gonna go ahead and put chapters throughout this whole video. Go ahead and look down below. You can jump forward to the part that interests you the most. Okay, the why, that is the million dollar question, isn't it? That's what we're all trying to figure out the answer to. And unfortunately, that has led to quite a bit of misinformation out there on the internet. I'm hoping to clarify some of that right now. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna go over some of the misconceptions about the why and what is causing this issue. Now, one of the primary theories that is out there is that the reason these are failing is because there's a lack of splash lubrication from the crankshaft. Now, the idea there is that on most engines, you have this crankshaft that's spinning around here and it's slinging the oil that is on that up onto the camshaft, which is above the crankshaft, and that's helping to lubricate those lobes. 
Now, I will say that while I agree that this issue is one of lubrication, I don't think that that specifically is the issue and I have a couple of reasons why that is the case. All right, so I'm gonna show you an example right now of why this is a popular theory. Now, this is a Hemi, this is a Gen 3 Hemi engine and it is upside down right now, so the crankshaft is on the top here. But you can see that just above where the crankshaft goes, there's this tube running all the way down the casting of the block here. Now, that is an oil gallery that is feeding to different areas of the pressurized oiling system. You can see that it does actually block the way between the crankshaft and the camshaft. So yes, you are not going to be getting the same kind of normal splash lubrication as you would on an older style engine. Now the primary reason why I don't feel like this is the actual source of the issue is because it overlooks a fundamental aspect of how the Hemi engine is built. Now if you notice these two ports right here on the engine, they actually have some oil plugs in them. These are oil galleries that actually run down the length of the entire block and they actually feed the lifter bores themselves. So you have pressurized oil going directly to those lifter bores. Now looking at the top of the engine, this is where one of your MDS solenoids go. That's your multi-displacement system solenoid. Now, if you look closely inside here, you can actually see that oil gallery. that's actually running down the full length of the block on both sides, feeding these lifter bores. So it should be clear here that if we're already getting pressurized oil to those lifter bores, we shouldn't be relying on splash lubrication to keep them oiled properly. Now, the second reason why I believe that splash lubrication is not the problem for our lifter failure is because these lifter failures that we're seeing, the cam lifter issues, are primarily happening on 2009 and later Hemi engines. They generally did not happen to these 03 to 08 models. Now, of course, stuff does happen. People have had lifter failures in those earlier gens, but not on the widespread scale that we saw from 2009 and on. So if it were a design failure issue with these blocks, it would have been present all the way back in 2003 when they very first came out because I have had a chance to actually directly compare a 2003 block and it looks almost identical to what they have now. They still have that oil gallery running right above the crankshaft. The lifters are in the exact same location and angle. Nothing different about that portion of the block at all. So if this was the problem due to a splash lubrication deal, it would have shown itself far before 2009. All right, the second misconception I wanna cover is that people think that MDS is the problem. If I just get rid of this MDS system, the multi-displacement system, that the problem will be solved and I'll never have cam and lifter failure. That is inaccurate as well, and I'll give you two reasons why. Now, the first reason is because once again, the MDS has been in play all the way back since 2005. So if MDS was the problem, we'd be seeing these cam lifter failures consistently with engines from 2005 and on, and we're just not seeing that. Now, the second reason is just as important, and that is that these cam and lifter failures are happening even on non-MDS equipped vehicles. In fact, my own personal 2011 Challenger that I had that was a manual transmission car and manual transmission Hemis did not come with an MDS system. But during a cam upgrade, I found that indeed my lifters were starting to fail on that vehicle. So again, this is not an MDS related issue. And honestly, I would encourage you if at all possible to go ahead and keep your MDS system because it, it does actually work pretty well and it does provide you a fuel savings. Now, direct from the manufacturer, they're telling me that it's good for about an 8% increase in fuel economy, which doesn't sound like a ton, but every little bit helps to be honest. Okay, our next misconception that I've heard is that people think, didn't they fix this problem when they changed to a new updated style lifter in 2016? And the answer is unfortunately, no, they didn't. We have continued to see cam lifter failures for 2016 and beyond. I'll go ahead and show you guys on screen right now a picture of the difference between the pre-2016 lifter and the post-2016 lifter. Now these newer ones, you can put those in any Hemi engine. They fit all the way back to 2003, it doesn't matter. Now along those same lines, people will say, well, why don't I just upgrade to a Hellcat lifter and that way I won't have these problems. Shouldn't that fix the issue as well? Well, in my left hand here, I hold a Hellcat lifter. In my right hand, I hold just a lowly RT lifter. Wait, was it, was it the other way? Maybe I had it, maybe I had these backwards. It doesn't matter, they're the exact same part number. There is literally nothing special about a Hellcat lifter. It is simply a non-MDS lifter. 
that's all it is. So your standard RT lifter that's a manual transmission, it gets the exact same lifters in it as the Hellcat does. Okay, I spoke about it briefly earlier, but I wanted to give you guys a better example of exactly how your MDS system works on your vehicle. Now you saw that those solenoids that were in the upper portion of the block, again, those run directly in those oil galleries that feed these lifter bores directly, right? So what you have with your lifters here, which are running on your cam lobes themselves, in each set of four lifters, you have two that are regular. Now, again, these are the exact same lifters that are present in a Hellcat, something like that. And then you have two of the MDS lifters. From the outside, the only physical difference that you will notice is that the MDS lifters have these holes with little pins in them. And that is the secret to the whole system. They use pressurized oil that these solenoids at the top of the block, when it activates your MDS system, they let full oil flow go to these lifters. Now, at all times, your non-MDS lifters have full oil flow going to them. These ones have some oil flow, but not full oil flow. Now, as soon as those solenoids turn on, it allows that full flow to go to these lifter bores and actually depresses these pins in the lifters themselves. The lifters then collapse to where as the lobe comes around and pushes the lifter up, it then just collapses the lifter. So basically you're no longer opening the valves on those cylinders. Now the PCM also shuts off the fuel injector for each of these cylinders. So it's not just uselessly throwing more and more fuel in there. As far as I know, it doesn't actually shut off the spark to that cylinder, but it really doesn't matter at that point. You're not putting any fuel in there. So you just have an empty cylinder with the valves that stay closed that's pumping up and down. Now, as soon as the MDS system wants to turn back off again, which I think I read something that says that this transition happens in like 0.04 of a second. So it is a pretty seamless system, but essentially the MDS solenoid will close. It will release that pressurized oil from going to these lifter bores. And at that point, the lifters will expand. These pins will pop out and actually hold the lifter solid again. And then you will actually be opening the valves again like you would have normally. Now, an interesting side effect that you might notice whenever you're taking your lifters out of your engine is that sometimes these pins will not be 100% centered in the hole. Sometimes they'll be offset a little bit higher, lower, or off to the side. That does not mean that the lifter has failed. This cylinder inside the lifter here that actually houses these pins, it spins freely inside of there. So it's constantly spinning even while the lifter is collapsed. So as it expands again, it only needs to spin until one of those pins locks into place in the hole. So again, it's not really a big deal if these pins aren't lined up correctly. That does not mean that your lifter has failed. Okay, we've talked a lot about some misconceptions. Now let's start to focus in on why I believe that this is happening to these engines. Now, as I mentioned, this problem really started to present itself around 2009 or 2009 and on. So what changed in 2009? Well, that was the introduction of VVT or variable valve timing, and that necessitated a change to the block itself, a very minor casting change here, but almost everything about the engine is different as a result of that. Also, it has those Eagle cylinder heads, the better cylinder heads. So really the engines are almost completely different between 03 to 08 and 09 and up. They have very similar design characteristics, but there's not very much that will actually interchange between those two uh, generations. So. I believe that when they made that change to the VVT system, it also necessitated a change to the camshaft itself, the design a little bit. And I feel like at that time there was a materials quality issue. And I think that's a lot of what's leading to these eventual failures. Now, it's not the worst thing in the world, especially because if these engines are lasting to generally 100,000 miles before they are having a failure, it's not like they're pure garbage or anything. I just believe that that was probably one thing that was leading to it. Now, another significant factor that really leads to these cam lifter failures are vehicles that are idling for extended periods of time. Whether you're stuck in traffic for hours every single day or fleet vehicles like police cars that are sitting idling on the side of the road for hours, or if you live in exceptionally cold climates like Canada and you're warming up your vehicles constantly for a very long time every single day, those are the vehicles that we see the absolute most cam lifter issues with. Now your Hemi engine has what's called a fixed displacement oil pump. That means for every single rotation of the crankshaft, this thing is going to put out an exact amount of oil. This means that the slower the crankshaft is moving, the less oil it's putting out. The faster the crankshaft is moving, the more oil it's going to be putting out. 
So you can imagine that if you are idling your engine for extended periods of time at around five or 600 RPM, that is going to be the lowest oil pressure that this thing can make. And when you're exposing your engine to that over a longer period of time, you can in fact experience issues with a lack of lubrication to certain components like the lifters or the camshaft itself. And in a nutshell, it is my belief that that's what we're really dealing with here is a lack of lubrication based on the amount of oil that's actually moving through your pressurized oiling system on your engine for extended periods of time. Now you can absolutely make the problem worse by not changing your oil at the recommended interval. So now you have dirty, worn out oil in combination with the lowest oil volume that your engine can make while it's running for extended periods of time. And I absolutely believe that that is the crux of the matter here. So I would say that one of the primary things my channel is known for on YouTube is that I do recommend installing a Hellcat oil pump on your 2009 and later Hemi engine to help prevent lifter failure. But why would we install a Hellcat oil pump? What's the difference with this pump that can make it better than the one that comes on your vehicle? Let's talk about it real quick. Now I've tested a multitude of different Hemi engines that are out there, both 5.7, 6.4, and 6.2 liter. And the 5.7 and 6.4 engines from 2009 and later, they all have the exact same oil pump in them that has a gear rotor size of 14 millimeters of thickness. Now the Hellcat oil pump has a gear rotor that is 16 millimeters in thickness. This is a difference of 12% more, which doesn't sound like a lot, but you think about, we're talking about oil volume here and 12% more oil, especially in those idle situations could really mean all the difference. Now, if you'd like to know a lot more about the specific differences between the different oil pumps that are out there, I have a much more comprehensive video that focuses only on that. I'll go ahead and link that right here and in the description down below. Now, something to note here is that the Hellcat oil pump is identical amongst all the different Hellcat models that are out there. They all use the exact same one. So the part number is identical, which I'll go ahead and put on the screen right here. As long as it's a 6.2 liter supercharged engine, it has that particular oil pump and that's the one that you want. Now, another thing to note here is that this Hellcat oil pump will bolt directly to a 5.7 or a 6.4 liter engine as long as it is a 2009 or newer with absolutely no modification whatsoever. It is a direct bolt-on fit. Now, if you have an 03 to 08 Hemi engine, you will need to use the Melling high volume pump instead. And I will put that part number on the screen right here. Now, another big misconception I've gotten a lot is people saying, hey, if we're dealing with a pressure issue and I need more oil pressure at idle, why don't I just bump up the viscosity from the factory 520, put like some 1030 in there, some 1040, something like that. Then I'll actually have higher pressure at idle and it'll be problem solved. But unfortunately, that's really not understanding fundamentally what's happening here. Your pressure is really just a reflection of restriction to flow. So if you're forcing the exact same amount of oil through an orifice, but you've made it thicker, it's gonna take more effort to push it through that same orifice. And that's what makes the pressure number go up. But you've literally changed nothing about what's actually happening inside the engine. The exact same amount of oil is going through it. Now, when you change to a high volume pump, you are physically pushing more oil through that same orifice. And that in turn makes the pressure number go up. So again, it's not the actual pressure number that we're searching for, it's the amount of oil. One thing I'd like to make abundantly clear here, if I haven't already, is we are again talking about volume of oil, not specifically pressure, because a lot of people say, well, why don't I just get a high pressure oil pump? And that is the opposite of what we want to do. So this is, let's say your factory oil pump. Now on this side of the graph here, we have your oil pressure and down here at the bottom, we have engine RPM. So again, the faster your engine goes, the more oil pressure it makes until it hits its breakover point. Basically it's relief pressure. Let's call it 65 PSI, 75, somewhere around there. And then it just bleeds off the excess at that point. When you're buying a high pressure oil pump, it changes nothing about these low RPM qualities of the pump. All it does is put a stiffer relief spring in there to where it makes more pressure up top here before it eventually bleeds it off. So all you're changing is the effect here at higher RPM, which is not our concern. We don't even care what's happening up there. There was already enough oil pressure all the way up here. So a high pressure oil pump changes nothing. However, if you're getting a high volume oil pump, then right from the start here, 
you're gonna be making more oil pressure because again, more oil is moving through the system. So that's what you want, high volume, not high pressure. Now this leads us straight into what are some of the common misconceptions that people have about putting a Hellcat oil pump on their engine. Now the first one I hear a lot is that people say, well, if you're putting a high volume pump onto your engine, won't that then starve the thing for oil because it's gonna send all of the oil up to the top end and then you're gonna starve the bottom end and you run your bearings out? You know, I can understand why people would think something like that because on a lot of older engines, that does seem to be an issue. Like, what was it? The uh, 455 Oldsmobile, something like that, had that kind of a problem. Something people have to remember is that we've moved past the 60s, okay? <laughs> They've learned from some of their mistakes over the years and we don't have those same types of problems here. The Hemi is actually very good. There's a lot of ports in the oil or in the heads themselves to drain that oil back to the pan. That's not really a major problem that we're having. Secondly, you also have to think about that the, the Hellcat oil pump is a factory oil pump. It's what comes on the engine stock. And the Hellcat engines have the exact same oil capacity as a factory Hemi does. So you would think if there was an issue with oil starvation, it would have more capacity. It would have like eight and a half quarts or something like that. It doesn't, it has seven quarts, the same as this factory Hemi does. So there's no issue with oil starvation with putting a higher volume pump on there. Now this engine here, this is my twin charged Magnum. If you haven't seen it yet, supercharged and turbocharged, I do have a Hellcat oil pump on this thing. Now granted, I don't have a ton of mileage on this thing because I keep blowing it up, but I don't have issues with oil starvation. I can watch the data logs of the oil pressure the whole time and everything is absolutely fantastic. I've never had any kind of a situation with a low oil situation with a Hellcat pump on a standard 5.7 engine. All right, the next misconception I get from people a lot is, man, if I'm having all of that oil pressure, when I start blowing out seals, rear main seal, a crank seal, valve cover gaskets, I'm gonna blow out seals all over the place. I can't run my pressure that high. And honestly, that's just a fundamental misunderstanding of how exactly your oiling system works inside your engine. The entire engine is not pressurized by oil. There are specific pathways and galleries where that pressurized oil actually runs. Only in that system is it pressurized. Once it actually moves out of that and just drains back to the pan here, the only pressure that's present there is your crankcase pressure. And let me tell you, if your crankcase pressure is strong enough to be blowing out your seals, whether it be valve cover gaskets, crank seal, or rear main seal, you have a, an entirely different problem happening there. Not to say I haven't seen that before, but it has nothing to do with your pressurized oiling system whatsoever at all. Having a high volume oil pump on your engine will not in any way expose your engine to blowing out valve cover gaskets or front or rear crank seals. All right, the next misconception is that this will fix a vehicle that is currently experiencing a lifter failure. That is absolutely inaccurate. This is only a preventative measure. If you are already experiencing a lifter failure, that is a mechanical issue that must be corrected. You need to actually replace whatever failed lifters you have and likely replace that camshaft as well. You can then add in a Hellcat oil pump to actually keep this from happening again but it will not fix an issue that is currently already happening. So up until now, I've basically just been covering information that I've covered in some of my previous videos. But right now I have some brand new information about installing a Hellcat pump on your vehicle that I think is really important. Now, when you're installing parts from vehicles that weren't originally intended to be on them, sometimes there can be weird side effects that no one could have seen coming. And that's kind of the case here on this Hellcat oil pump. While it's actually producing the oil flow that we're looking for and giving us that additional flow, there are some people who have been reporting to me that they're getting a code on their car. It's a P0524, which is engine oil pressure low. Now that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense because as we know, we're putting more oil through the system. And so how could it possibly be getting oil pressure low? Now to this point, I didn't have a solution for them. I had been studying some different things, trying to figure some different things out and had so far been coming up empty. But I'm really glad to tell you guys that I did figure it out. I understand exactly what's happening and I have a solution for you guys. Now over the last year or so, I've been in contact with some people through Instagram that have been 
feeding me some information, trying to help me figure out what exactly is going on here. And one really important thing that we were able to determine was that this code only seems to set when the MDS system is active. Now, if they turn it off, the code didn't seem to set. So that was really important for me to know, to realize that the MDS system was actually impacting this code. Now on the Twin Charge Magnum, that is running a Hellcat oil pump, but I'm not running MDS on it, so I never had that code problem on that car. However, when I picked up this 2005 Chrysler 300, I did put a Melling high volume pump on this car, and in fact, it did start setting that exact same code, the P0524 engine oil pressure low. And honestly, weirdly, that actually made me really happy because now I have a test vehicle where I can actually check and find out exactly what's happening. So the first thing I did was I took our factory scan tool that we use at Dodge and I turned it into a flight recorder mode. What that does is that when it sets the check engine light, it immediately records not only that instant in time, but 30 seconds before and 30 seconds after. So you can do a data log of that whole thing and see exactly what's happening. Now, of course, I keyed in on what the oil pressure was doing at that time. Do you want to know what it was? 76 PSI. Clearly, we were not low on oil pressure. So clearly I had to do a little bit more digging. So I checked out that code itself. I tried to get as specific as I could in seeing what the reasons for it to set were. And I found something very interesting. And the primary thing I found was that it doesn't actually mean that the oil pressure is low. Now that sounds kind of weird, right? I mean, that's specifically what the code says, engine oil pressure low. But to be honest, it's not really that unusual. Here's something you guys need to understand is that all of these codes, the engine codes you have, those are global codes, which means that they're shared amongst all the different automotive manufacturers. So when they assign these codes to certain things, sometimes they don't necessarily line up 100% exactly. It's just like that was the closest one they could find that basically addressed the issue that they thought they were going to find. So it does happen out there that the code doesn't specifically mean exactly what it says. Let me explain this a little further. So as I mentioned earlier, this P0524 code is specifically addressing the MDS system. Now the MDS system requires a great many different parameters to come into play before it will actually activate the system. So what that means is it's looking at a list of, I think it's somewhere around 30 different parameters to say, okay, if these are all correct, then I will engage the system. And one of those parameters is the oiling system. It needs to be in a certain range of oil pressure. What that means, and I found a published number here, that for the low side, it needs to be reading at least 25 PSI of oil. But what that also means is if there's a low side, it also means that there's an upper limit that it's looking for for it to be within. Now, I couldn't find any published numbers as far as what that number is, but clearly when we put a high volume pump on these vehicles, it is exceeding that upper number. In my case, it's up here at 76 PSI. So whatever this number is, which I'm gonna take a random guess and say it's 55 PSI. If it's above that number, for a great enough period of time while the MDS is trying to activate, it's saying, this is the code you get, P0524, which says oil pressure low, but what it really means is the oil pressure is not in the range I'm expecting it to be, so therefore I cannot activate your MDS system. That is what is exactly happening. Now, unfortunately, what this means is that if you have already installed a Hellcat oil pump on your 5.7 or 6.4 engine, then your MDS system will not activate at all. I have tested this quite a bit on my 300 right here. And no matter what, even before this code sets, it will not engage the MDS system at all. Now, again, because this is an MDS related code only, if you've already deleted MDS from your engine or you're planning to get rid of it, or if you have one that never came with MDS, you will never experience this code. So don't even worry about it. But if you do have MDS and you want it to still work on your vehicle, which I assume a large majority of you do, we're gonna have to take care of this code. Okay, so we know that the code is setting because the oil pressure is actually too high, not too low. It's just not in the range that it's expecting to see it. So how do we correct that signal to where the computer sees what it's expecting to see, and that way it can actually engage your MDS system? Well, we have to use a device that's actually extremely simple 
and extremely cheap as well. It's called a voltage divider. Now basically we're going to use this device to fool the signal coming from your oil pressure sensor and going to the PCM. All we're gonna do is we're gonna knock it right back down to what it was before we installed the Hellcat pump on there and that's going to address the entire issue. Okay, the oil pressure sensor on the Hemi engine is a simple five volt reference signal. Now what this means is the three wire sensor here, you have a five volt supply that goes in and then inside the sensor itself, there's a variable resistor that changes with the pressure in there. And that signal comes out of your uh, sensor itself and goes back to the PCM. And then you have your ground wire right here. What we're going to be doing here is modifying this signal wire to change the voltage that's coming out of that to fool the PCM about what's happening. Now I admit that on the surface, that sounds like a scary thing to do that we're changing the signal that's going in the PCM, but honestly, it's not a scary thing to do at all in person. You can see that it's very simple. I'll show you the device here in just a couple of minutes. It's not a big deal at all. And secondly, this is what most aftermarket tuners do in a lot of situations. It's basically fooling the PCM about the signal that's coming to it and changing that a little bit so the PCM reacts accordingly. That's a lot of what these aftermarket tuners actually do. So in this case, all we're doing is we're setting it back to what the factory is, or what the factory PCM is expecting to see. So with this simple graph right here, you can see that with our high volume oil pump here, obviously we're making more pressure. So our signal voltage is going to be higher. Now on the Hellcat pump versus your factory pump, you're getting about a 12% increase in volume, which changes the signal amount 12%. And this will allow your MDS system to work just fine. So how does the voltage divider work then? Well, you have your input voltage right here, and then it goes through a single resistor here, which is then connected to another resistor, which then goes to ground. Now you can see here, you have your input voltage, and then these two ends of the resistor are tied together, and this is your output that goes to the PCM, and this one gets connected directly to ground. I'll show you what that looks like on my 300 here. Now what's important here is what size resistors these actually are, because again, we're trying to actually modify the signal. Now there's a ton of different voltage divider calculators out there on the internet where you can figure out these numbers for yourself. But again, we're trying to knock this number down 12% from what it was. The first resistor, the one that the signal wire is going into is going to be a 1000 ohm resistor. Now our second resistor down here is going to be a 7.4 thousand ohm resistor. Now again, you can do these calculations yourself online, verify them for yourself, but this will in fact knock down your signal 12% from what it was all the way through the range. Another important point I wanted to add here is that if you have an 03 to 08 model and you have installed the Melling high volume pump, the value of your resistors is going to be different because the pump size is different. It is 20% larger than your factory pump is. So you wanna knock that signal down 20%. So in that case, your initial resistor here needs to be a 1000 ohm resistor. And the secondary resistor down here is going to be a 4,000 ohm resistor. That will knock the signal down 20% and get you right back to factory specs. So again, the only thing we're changing here is on one single wire. This is your signal wire coming out of your oil pressure sensor and going back to your PCM. So at some point along this wire, it doesn't have to be right here next to the sensor itself. It could be at any point between the sensor and the PCM. Basically, we're going to cut this wire right here, and then we're going to put in that resistor. It connects with the other resistor, which then goes to ground, and then this output here connects to this end that goes to the PCM. It's literally that simple. There's almost nothing to it. I bought, I don't know, I, I paid probably $10 to have a pack of 200 of these resistors. <laughs> so for $10, I can make 200 of these things. So it's not a financial thing at all. This is very cheap. It just requires a little bit of wiring, a tiny, tiny bit of wiring, and it will knock that signal right back down to the factory. And I have been testing it on my 300 here for a couple of weeks now. It works absolutely perfectly. No problems at all. MDS works like it's supposed to, and we're not setting a code anymore. 
Okay, here is the voltage divider on the 300 here. I just wired it into this C100 plug right here. So again, you don't have to do it way up here where the oil pressure sensor is. Just follow that wire all the way back to where it goes to the PCM. And then this is it. This is the entire voltage divider right there. I encased it in some heat shrink wrap there. And then the signal goes onto the PCM right there. That's it. That solves the whole issue. Now, unfortunately in this video, I can't tell you exactly what color wire this is because as the years change and the models change, this wire color does actually change. I looked up four or five different models and there was a difference between them. So you're gonna have to do a little bit of research on your own, figure out a wiring diagram to figure out exactly what color wire the signal wire is that's coming out of your oil pressure sending unit. Now I do have an alternative method as well if you are not comfortable with modifying your vehicle's wiring harness, which I completely understand that. Now, interestingly enough, this is one of those deals where, you know, I was so proud of myself for coming up with a solution here, when in reality, there's again, multiple ways to accomplish the same goal. And one of my viewers posted on one of my pages about what he had done, and I was like, you know what? That's actually a really good solution as well. Might even be a better solution. Now his name is Mosin Virus. I'll put his username right down here. But what he did essentially was he took the Hellcat oil pump and took the relief spring from his stock pump and put it in the Hellcat pump. That basically made it to where it would bleed off at 65 PSI and it wouldn't generate these really high PSI numbers that were causing that code to set in the first place. So basically on the upper RPM, it's acting exactly like a stock pump, which is completely fine. But down the lower RPM, it is still generating more oil and more pressure than the stock pump does. So basically everything you need to do, like I said, it's a really elegant solution. Now, the one thing I do have to say is that I have not done that myself. So I haven't been able to do any testing on it to verify that that will in fact actually keep the code from setting, but it does sound very logical. And I believe that that would be an effective solution. So essentially it's kind of a whichever one you're more comfortable with if you're putting a hellcat pump in maybe go ahead and swap out that release spring from your original pump into the hellcat pump or if you've already installed a high volume pump you'll probably have to go with the wiring route to correct it from there so to quickly recap for you guys i believe that the two best defenses against having lifter failure on your vehicle is to number one actually be sure you are doing your oil changes on time and doing your maintenance properly. Now, the amount of times I've had people swear to me up and down that they've done all of their oil changes on time, and then I actually do the repair to their car and the inside of the engine is telling me a very different story. So again, make sure you're doing your oil changes on time. And honestly, don't pay any attention to the oil change reminder that's actually in your vehicle. That actually takes information from like 30 different things to make changes as far as when it's recommending an oil change. I don't like that thing. I think it stretches out the intervals too far. I think 5,000 miles is where you need to be doing your oil changes. Don't stretch it any further than 5,000 miles. I think that's going to be your number one prevention against having lift or tick failure. Secondly though, I do believe as a preventative measure that this Hellcat oil pump is a great idea because again, it is a direct bolt-on to any 09 and up 5.7 and 6.4 engine, and it's just extra protection. Now, I do have a lot of people who are saying, well, you don't have any proof that this actually fixes anything. And to that I say, yeah, I don't. I don't have any proof. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of vehicles driven in a variety of different ways over hundreds of thousands of different miles. How could I possibly replicate that in any kind of test that would convincingly prove that this solves anything? Basically, I'm just going off my experience as over 10 years of working as a Dodge technician, this is what I've seen. And especially the vehicles that are most affected are the ones that have extended idle time. So to my mind, I think if we can get some extra oil in the engine in those idle situations, that can't possibly be a bad thing. So. It's up to you guys, whether you agree with me or not, it really doesn't matter. I'm just telling you my experiences. All right, you guys, I know that there was a lot in this video. Really appreciate you guys if you stuck around and watched the whole entire thing. Let me know if you learned something here. Let me know what your comments are, what your thoughts are. I appreciate hearing all of that. The only way we can learn is if we are all sharing that knowledge together. So. Thank you so much for watching this. I hope you'll stick around the channel and watch some other things. I got some very interesting builds happening on this channel as well, but I appreciate you guys. We'll see you next time on Reignited.